Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me for Facebook Live. My name is John Phipps, lead pastor of Park Place Church in Pinellas Park, Florida. And I uh, <clears throat> hope you're having a wonderful Friday morning. Uh, I've already been outside doing some yard work. It's really hot out there. I think it's uh, just going to get hotter as the day goes on. But anyway, hope you guys are doing well. Good to see you, Hillary and Diana. Thank you for joining me. Sheila, how are you, my friend? <clears throat> Good to see you. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> today's Friday and I'm just uh, kind of working from home. Good morning, Pam. And I have a, a devotion that I want to share with you that uh, uh, I actually spoke on not that long ago, uh, but this is a little bit different. Good morning, Julie. I hope you guys are doing well. So I wonder what you got planned for the weekend. Um, I'm not sure what I have planned. Good morning. Um, thinking probably yard work today <clears throat> and then tomorrow. Uh, back in the office, I've got to uh, prepare a presentation for Esther School, uh, which is where Sweet Dina works at Esther School. They meet in our building, uh, but they actually have eight campuses. So I'm going to be doing a presentation for them on Monday for an hour and a half on uh, racial equality. And I'm looking forward to that, but a lot of research goes into that. Good morning. I see your names there. <clears throat> so racial equality, be praying for me as I do a presentation on Monday. I want to say and, and, and um, be effective. Uh, I want to say the right things and be effective in everything uh, having to do with uh, racial equality and um, uh, giving people uh, respect and showing kindness and uh, being fair among people of different social economic backgrounds and ethnicities, uh, people that are different genders, things like that. So social equality isn't just about Black Lives Matter movement and all this other stuff that's going on right now with the protesting. Uh, social equality is just allowing uh, everyone to be treated with great respect and dignity. Uh, we all deserve that. <clears throat> Jesus loves us all the same, and uh, we have to be very careful to guard our heart against anything that would appear to be either racist or... Um, um, showing partiality to one particular ethnicity or gender <clears throat> or even age. Uh, we, if we're not careful, we can sometimes uh, discriminate because people are a certain age and, uh, you know, we just have to be careful. We're human, um, but that is never tolerated and we find in Scripture that God is no respecter of persons, uh, which simply means that He loves us all and He loves us all the same. He died for each and every one of us. So be praying for me as I uh, continue my research on social equality uh, and um, being kind. <clears throat> it's a Christian school, so I'm going to be using some scripture and uh, probably some stories from the Bible as well. Good morning, Denise. I see all your names there. Everybody has joined us. We had 17. We have 16 now. As soon as we have 20, we will begin our devotion. So... Uh, what are your plans for the weekend, guys? Feel free to type that in there. Let me know what you're doing this weekend. Um, one of the interesting things was um, my air conditioning went out last night. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good, if you're asking me. Oh, you're talking to Denise. Okay, gotcha. Um, but the air conditioning went out last night, so that was a little uncomfortable for us. And uh, we got through the night, and this morning I called an AC tech, and he gave me some... Um, uh, some suggestions and I took his suggestions and I did what he asked me to do and I basically had to put a shop vac on the drain hose and get some extra water out of the drain hose. Little did I know uh, it was an easy fix and uh, so drive careful Joe as you're as you're watching. We've got 21 so we're going to get started here. We are talking about prayer again because prayer is so important. So don't, uh, don't jump off here because uh, prayer isn't your favorite topic. Let me tell you something. Uh, my friends. I'm not going to be preaching on the Lord's Prayer, uh, aka the Disciples' Prayer. I'm going to be teaching from three different pieces of Scripture, and uh, I know there are ones that you probably know, but I want to begin our time together this morning by talking about four different quotes. So I'm quoting people that you know. First one is John Wesley, then Martin Luther, and then D.L. Moody, and then Oswald Chambers. And there's a lot of wonderful quotes by E.M. Bounds. If you want to read about prayer, uh, pick up a book on uh, prayer by E.M. Bounds. He has several of them, and they're all very good. I don't have any quotations from him today. The one that um, 
I, I have memorized just as a, a young pastor uh, in Bible college. I was about 22 years old when I found this quote and it was by E.M. Bounds and I pulled it from a book that I was reading by E.M. Bounds and it said, the man who wants to be mighty in the pulpit needs to be mighty in his closet before God. And I thought of that because the Lord was calling me to preach. And the man that wants to be mighty in the pulpit before men needs to be mighty in his closet before God. And uh, I want you to know that <clears throat> I do my best when it comes to preaching, but um, I am not a preacher if I'm not a prayer warrior. Everything in our Christian faith, Christian walk, Christian witness hinges on prayer. Uh, that's my quote. Um, that's just, that's just, that's not, that's not Ian Bounds, but uh, everything is, is uh, hinging on prayer. So uh, prayer is the foundation of the Christian faith. Uh, I know that you can say it's God's word, certainly uh, you can make a strong case for that, but you know, between you know prayer and spending time with God and speaking to God and then reading his word and letting him speak to you is a, is a communion, it's a relationship, it's a conversation between you and God, my friends, and there is no other thing in life that's more important than spending time with God, speaking to him and telling him what you need and what you want and your desires and talking to him as a friend, uh, as a, um, a family member, uh, because we are in his family, amen? So John Wesley said this, I like this quote, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. John Wesley says, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. I love that, God answers prayer. And God moves when we come together and pray. So how is it that we often forget to pray? How is it we get tired at night and we say, oh, I should probably pray, but I'm so tired I can't keep my eyes open because we binge watched on Netflix too long. My friends, this should not be. We need to be people of prayer and conviction. We need to be people that are open and receiving the, the, the wonderful communication that God has for us. You know, just like Morse code became really popular uh, before the telephone, I suppose, people could finally communicate long distance. Then the telephone. People can finally communicate through the telephone, then cell phone, then texting, and then, you know, FaceTime and Skype and everything else. Listen, my friends, we value communication with each other. We're doing it right now. We are having a wonderful line of communication. I am basically sharing quotations and scriptures, teaching you some basic principles of prayer. This is a form of communication. I'm, I'm seeing you, you, your comments there. Your names are flashing through my screen. Uh, but why is it that we love communication and communication devices, but we don't love prayer, my friends? And I don't mean that as a judgment, so please don't receive that as a judgment. But if it's true in your life and the shoe fits, it fits. We need to love prayer just as much as we love communicating with each other because we are literally communicating with the God of the universe who knows all about us, who loves us, who sent his son to die for us. Martin Luther said this, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance but laying hold of his willingness. I love that. Martin Luther, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. God isn't waiting to bless us and release the blessing just simply because um, <clears throat> he's waiting for us to, you know, to, to, to do good deeds or something. God is asking us, wanting us, to come before him and to let our prayer requests be known. It's why we pray for each other. It's why we, we lift each other up and we carry each other's burdens, my friends. We need to. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. I don't think God is reluctant, but it's prayer is laying hold of his willingness. Because if he's willing, but he's not asked, why would he respond? If I am willing to give you $1,000, but you don't ask for it, why would I give it to you? If I am willing to give you my time, but you don't ask for it, why would I give it to you? If you were starving and I was, I, I, I was willing to bring over a meal, a wonderfully cooked meal, 
but you didn't ask me for it. Why would I go to your doorstep and knock on your door? My friends, you have not because you ask not, the Bible says. So Martin Luther says, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. God isn't reluctant. It's laying hold of his willingness. It's grabbing that which God wants to already give you. And I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm talking about his presence. I'm talking about his favor. I'm talking about his anointing. And yes, sometimes that is material blessing. But there's no greater blessing than being in the presence of God, our creator. There is no greater blessing than having his hand of favor on you, having his blessing on you. Okay, D.L. Moody. <clears throat> We're going to get to the word pretty soon. Just hang in there with me. D.L. Moody, I love this. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Every great movement of God can be traced back to a kneeling figure. My friends, are you that kneeling figure? Do you get on your knees before God and pour out your heart to God and pray for revival for our wonderful country? I love this country. I make no apologies for it. I say that a lot. I just don't. You know, I signed up for the army because I love this country. And it was peacetime. It was boring. But nevertheless, I am as patriotic as anybody else. But if this country is going to be a godly country again, we have to have revival, my friends. We cannot be a Christian country without revival. We are a post-Christian country. Now, even that is sketchy. What that means is that we used to be a country with Christian morals and virtues, and I think we've gotten away from that. I consider us a post-Christian country. D.L. Moody says, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. You want a movement of God? Get on your knees and pray and ask God to uh, give us revival in our country, to bring revival to this great country of ours. Oh, that hearts would be changed and, and, and people would, would, would love God again and they would, quit, they would quit worrying about, you know, keeping score and who's got this and who's got that and who's entitled to this and all these things and Democrats and Republicans and all this politics. It's exhausting, my friends. What we need is a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit upon our country. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. I love it. I love your comments too, and I, I, I do see that there. Thank you so much for sharing your comments. The last scripture I wanna, or the last quotation I wanna uh, share with you before we get into our, our scriptures is Oswald Chambers. Now you know these guys, John Wesley, right? From Methodism, I mean, the Holy Club, his brother Charles wrote hymns. Uh, he had wonderful uh, contemporaries, you know, um, Martin Luther, right? Uh, rebellious against the Catholic Church. Um, um, D.L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. I shared his uh, quote with you. And then Oswald Chambers, of course, My Utmost for His Highest, one of the greatest devotional books ever written. This is what Oswald Chambers says. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Amen. Let me read it again. Oswald Chambers. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. It is the greater work. I love that. Prayer doesn't enable me to do greater things. Prayer is the greater thing, my friends. You see, I said that revival will come if we are faithful on our knees, and that's true. But the greatest work is prayer. Now, revival is a byproduct of prayer, okay? Uh, which means when prayer happens, revival tends to be the result. God blessing us with his Holy Spirit and causing hearts to be changed and come back to him is a result of prayer. But the greatest work is prayer. I love this quote by Os Oswald Chambers. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Wow. I just shared with you four really good quotations. John Wesley, Martin Luther, D.L. Moody, and Oswald Chambers. And if you want to 
also remember the one I shared with you from E.M. Bounce. A man that is mighty in his prayer closet before God is mighty in the pulpit before men. And I want to be mighty in the pulpit before men. But my primary responsibility is to be mighty in my prayer closet before God. So where is your prayer closet, my friends? Huh? You got to have a prayer closet. Where do you pray? Do you have a hammock in the backyard? Do you have a chair maybe in the backyard? Do you have maybe a certain place in your bedroom you like to kneel down and pray? Where is it that you find peace with God? Good morning, Dan. Thanks for joining me again, buddy. Where is it that you meet with God and allow him to meet with you, my friends? Don't tell me that you're always with God. God's in your car. God is in the trees. God's in nature. You know, God is not that. God is in heaven and he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we may communicate with him through the work of the Holy Spirit. But it is an action. Prayer is an action. It is, in, it is an instantaneous event, okay? Now, the Bible says to pray without ceasing, so I'm not taking away from what Paul says, but the point is this, that prayer is something we do. It's an activity that we engage in. So if you're working, doing administration or doing accounting or doing nursing, that's wonderful. And you're busy and you're very task driven throughout the course of your day. But don't get so task driven that you forget to make time for prayer. Prayer is, a, is an event. Okay? Prayer has to be scheduled. It has to be an event in your day, my friends. I understand that you can pray in your car and I understand you can go out in the in, in the wilderness and you can you can pray and I understand that you know you can mow the lawn and pray at the same time I'll do that later today but my point is this it has to be intentional Prayer has to be intentional and it has to be scheduled and sometimes my friends it should also be just maybe spontaneous because the Lord calls us to pray and maybe he wakes us up in the middle of the night to pray and then we hear somebody who's hurting and we just stop and pray. How many times do you read Facebook and somebody needs prayer? Okay, I'm praying for you right now. Put your phone down, start praying. Don't keep scrolling, my friends. Don't keep scrolling. Don't for, you will forget that prayer request. Put your phone down. Get on your knees or sit in your seat if you, if you can't get on your knees and pray for that person. Close your eyes. Be intentional about prayer. Prayer is not passive. It's active. Okay? My lawn isn't going to get mowed just because I will it to be so. It's not going to mow itself. Prayer doesn't happen with us, without us being intentional, making time for prayer. When we make time for prayer, that means we schedule it or we are intentional about it. We put away other things and we focus solely on our time with the Lord. That is prayer, my friends. Let's talk about what the Bible has to say about prayer. Let's take a look at Philippians 4.6. I know that you already know some of these verses. Uh, if somebody can type that in there for me, if you would. Philippians 4, 6. Inevitably, somebody says, what's that scripture again? Philippians 4, 6. This is what Philippians 4, 6 says. <clears throat> Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your request to God. I love that. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. My friends, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about COVID-19. Don't be anxious about how you're going to handle things next month or what you're going to do tomorrow. The Bible says today has enough trouble of its own. I'm not saying you shouldn't plan, but my goodness, my friends, stay in the present. Pray for what you need today. That's what Jesus said. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Do not be anxious about anything. By prayer and petition. So 
I always say there's, there's three things needed in prayer. The first one you wanna do is come before the Lord and confess your sins. I've shared this with you before, but it's really important. Confess your sins, get it out in the open. If you've got any unrepentant sin, make that first. Second is praise God. Take as much time as you want and just praise God. And I'm gonna demonstrate these three things at the end. And the third thing is to go ahead and make your request known to God and lift up your friends that are hurting, that are struggling, okay? Let's take a look at James 5, 16. James 5, 16. If you would like to type that in there, that would probably be really helpful for others. James 5, 16. James is right after Hebrews, uh, before Peter and John, or 1 Peter and 1 John. James 5, 16, my friends. <clears throat> Thank you for typing that in, Sheila. I love James 5, 16. It's awesome. This is what James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, writes. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Wow. That's prayer right there. Confess your sins to each other. I told you that's the first thing you need to do in prayer. The second thing is praise and the third thing is your requests. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed for the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Sometimes I mix my NIV and my King James Version together because you know what? When I remember scripture, I tend to remember King James easier than I do NIV. So I kind of go back and forth. But that's, what it, that's basically what it's saying, is that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So if we want to be powerful and effective in the pulpit, if we want to be powerful and effective in our evangelism, or powerful and effective as a husband or a wife or a parent, then we need to be in prayer. We cannot forsake prayer and be strong Christians. There is no such thing as being a strong Christian without prayer, my friends. It's impossible. You want to be a strong Christian? Have a strong prayer life. Well, pastor, I thought it was about obedience. Yes, it is. Be obedient to prayer. Be obedient to reading scripture. Do you ever pray scripture? I do. Not that God doesn't know his words. I know he knows his words. But I pray scripture because I can feel the presence of heaven coming down and blessing me when I am praying scripture to the Lord. Sometimes I pray that in, you know, in church and in our services and I'm praying and, and, and a verse just comes to me. I don't know. It just comes to me. The Holy Spirit reveals it to me and I just pray it. But three things in prayer, confession, praise, petition. Let's look at one more. We're going to go to the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles 7.14. You knew I was going to go there. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Go ahead and put that in there. It's one of my favorite verses of all time. And I've already shared it with you before. And I'm going to share it again in closing. And then we're going to have a wonderful time of prayer. God is so good. Thank you for joining me. I see your names there. Thank you. All right. 2 Chronicles um, in the Old Testament, you'll find it. It's, uh, let's see here. Obviously, it's after First Chronicles, but I think it's after Samuel too, right? Second, it's after Kings and Samuel. Isn't Samuel before Kings? Yeah. So, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. Yep, Second, second Chronicles 7.14. You got it. And you know this verse, and I love this verse, and our country needs this verse more than anything. This is what it says, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Wow. 
That's a wonderful verse, my friends, about prayer. I mean, I know when I was doing a kind of a, a joint um, devotion with my friend, Pastor Stephen from Bible College. You remember it didn't go very well because we had some sound issues, but we were gonna talk about the Lord's Prayer uh, known as the Disciples Prayer, which we could study, it's great. He spent like, I don't know, a month on the Disciples Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But this verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Is it possible to pray without seeking God's face? Absolutely. My friends, you do it all the time. Be honest. We all pray without seeking God's face. Do you seek God's face over your meals before you eat? I don't think I do. Sometimes I ask Monty to pray for us, you know. And he's got kind of a repetitive prayer that he's learned. And it's cute. And some of the words we can make out and some of them we can't. And that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I love for him to have that opportunity. And But when I pray over my food, my meal... Come on, be honest with me. Don't let me just kind of be out on that limb by myself. You know, you know, we are not seeking God's face necessarily. We're asking for his blessing over our food. We're thanking him for our food, which for me, lunch is going to be veggie fajitas. It's going to be great. And I'm going to ask a blessing over it. But my friends, there's a difference between praying over your food and calling that your prayer time and getting on your knees and seeking the face of God, okay? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14 my friends, it's powerful. I think there's three ands in there. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Three things. I love it. Pray, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways. My friends. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. That's what you got to do. That we're, that's what we're going to do in closing. It's a wonderful verse, my friends, but God is giving us a layout of how we need to pray. Pray, seek my face, and turn from your sin. My friends, all of us struggle. We have temptation and sin. And the greatest the greatest way we can deal with sin in our lives is through prayer. First of all, by confessing our prayer, our, our sins. We have to confess our sins. We have to seek the face of God. We have to turn from our wicked ways. Some of us have addictions. Some of you are struggling with all kinds of things. Drugs, alcohol, lust, pride. Uh, some of you are dealing with, you know, um, overeating issues. Some of you are, are running to the refrigerator rather than running to God. Some of you are running to pills rather than running to prayer. Some of you are running to alcohol instead of enjoying the presence of God. My friends, I was asked to teach on prayer today. I hope I did it justice. I love you guys. I know this isn't the most exciting topic because it's a discipline. It will always be a discipline and it will never be easy. And there's times in which I force myself to pray and seek the face of God. You're not alone. I'm with you. It doesn't come natural to me. I'm not the Apostle Paul. I can't pray without ceasing very well. No, I can't. I have to be disciplined to read and to pray every single day for strength and for power, that I might be a great man of God, because that's what I aspire to be. Thank you, Eileen. I need this too. My friends, it is a discipline. You get up every morning and you go to work because you're disciplined. But if we're not careful, we forsake our time with our loving Jesus. 
So let us close our time together. I see my time is up. So we're going to close in prayer. Three things, remember? How do we pray? Confession, praise, and we make our requests known. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that now. Are you ready? Okay, get ready. Here we go. Father, I want to first of all say I love you. I confess any known sin to you, Lord. I confess any unknown sin to you. I know, Lord, that temptation is around me each and every day. And sometimes, Lord, I can be grumpy and I can be rude and sometimes I can be difficult. Even as the air conditioner wasn't working last night, I was grumpy and I couldn't fix it and I couldn't figure it out. And Father, I pray that you'll forgive me for being short with my wife. You know, Lord, it was, a, it was an uncomfortable situation and I handled it poorly. And I ask for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. I'm a work in progress, Lord. I'm a sinner saved by grace and you have made me a saint only by the blood of Jesus. But Father, I know I fail you and I hate it when I do. Father, there is no God like my God. There is no Savior like my Jesus. There is no peace like the Holy Spirit living in me. I thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. I praise you, Jesus. You are my Lord and my Savior. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the author and finisher of my faith, the lover of my soul. You are my best friend. I love you more than I love anything in this world, even my family. Jesus, I thank you for all that you've bestowed upon me, all the many blessings that I have, the anointing that I have from you to preach your word, the love that I have for other people, which is not of me, it's of you, because I'm just a, a wretched person. But God, you have given me the ability to love. And only that can come from Jesus, who loved me so much that he paid my debt on the cross and bled and died on Calvary. So I thank you, Jesus. I lift you up. I praise you for who you are. And thank you, Father, for sending me your son. And thank you, Jesus, for allowing the Holy Spirit to reside in my heart. And Father, I lift up right now some prayer requests. I pray for those who have lost loved ones, even within our church. I'm not going to name them all by names. But God, you know who they are. They are near and dear to my heart. Some have lost a husband or a wife, a child or a parent. Some have lost a friend. I lift them up to you right now, Lord. You know my heart hurts for them. I pray for the service that we're going to be having at our church on Saturday. I pray that that a celebration of life service for Bob Fegley goes really, really well. He loved you, Jesus, and he is with you now. And I pray that you help me to do a good job. Help me, God, to speak powerfully. Help those that are going to have the uh, opportunity to share a story, uh, to speak, and to um, remember Bob and his great love for Jesus. Father, I lift up this country, which is just... I think, I think just falling apart. We're polarized. We're struggling, God, over feelings and fear and, and overcome with, with uh, doubt, uncertainty for our future. Father, I pray for our president. I pray for our leaders, our senators, our congressmen. I pray for our local officials. I pray for the people, Lord, that'll be voting in November. Father, I don't know where we're going but I just wish we would get closer to you. And I pray that you would bring revival to our land. Father, I pray that our hearts would be warmed and, 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 and that we would, we would recognize our sin. We would be so convicted of our sin, our shame and our guilt would overwhelm us. That we would cry out, what must we do to be saved? And put our faith in Jesus. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one shall come to the Father except through me. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I thank you 
for I know that you are faithful, and I praise you for your goodness and your mercy. And you said, Lo, I am with you always, even until the very end of the age. You are here with us now. You are present with us while we are praying together. Thank you for this simple lesson on prayer today. Help us, God, to be disciplined in our prayer life, to lift up others, to praise you, and to confess our sins before you as I have already today. I love you and praise you and thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness shown to me and to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So that's how it's done, my friends. That's how you confess your sins, praise God, and lift each other up in prayer because we need it. It was a short prayer. Prayers don't have to be long. Jesus rebuked those Pharisees that had long prayers and wanted to be seen on the street corners to be admired by men. I'm telling you that your prayers need to be mighty, fervent, and powerful, but they don't have to be long, my friends. They can be, but they don't have to be. I feel like I just met with Jesus, and you all got to hear it and listen to it and pray along with me. That's prayer, my friends. Lift each other up. Encourage each other. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed and continue to make prayer a discipline in your life. I love you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you Sunday morning. I have a, I have a sermon prepared for you. Good morning, Laura. Thank you for joining me. Esther, all my friends are here. And uh, I need you guys. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. Have a blessed day.